Mark, you've, um, in your book, The, the Dangerous Act of, of Worship, have talked about the church as uh, largely asleep. And uh, uh, Steve, you've, you could share on your own, but you've used this class, um, this book in your classes and been influenced by it, strongly agree with it, have seen fruit in your students. Um, so just let's kind of begin the a conversation, not necessarily about the book, but about the important subject that you're developing in the book. Um, Tell me about what you mean that the, that the church is, is asleep and um, talk about examples, illustrations to, to, to justify the idea and, and then explain to us the connection that you've seen with, with worship and uh, the dangerous act of worship and, and the uh, sleepiness of the yeah. church. I think what I mean by, by asleep is inert, that the, the church is simply inert uh, on many levels, especially the, the church in, in privileged nations uh, is, a, is an inert to the passions of God for the things that are often just not on our personal agenda. So we're, we're as good as asleep when it comes to many of the things that I think matter most to God. And it's an ironic thing because we have a whole industry of church life that is seemingly given to trying to become attentive to the things that matter to God. But the things that we claim matter to God are often conveniently tailored, of course, to be the things that matter most to us. So a lot of the shape of the North American church is a reflection of the culture quest that we're already engaged in and then the church's attempt to try to fill the gap of those concerns. Those concerns are real, but they make us often, I think, as good as asleep when it comes to the things that are, are not on our personal, individual, uh, psychological, social agenda. And many of those things, it seems to me, are some of the primary things that the God of the Bible suggests really matter to God. And costly, sacrificial love, especially toward people that are going to pay us no social benefit, is not high on the rank of values for many of us and many churches. It's really much more uh, a faith that's, that's often oriented toward finding peace in our own inner life, finding an assurance of our personal value, finding some sense of personal community, all of which matters to God. I, I clearly believe that. But I also think it means that, that that drug is so intoxicating that it can often put us to sleep to other things that matter to God. And many of those things are not going to serve our self-interest. And so the argument about the dangerous act of worship is that faithful worship is dangerous because it really wakes us up to things that will actually put our individualized, more comfort and safety seeking life at risk if we're really faithful to what it is that the scriptures are saying. So. And it sure seems that, that part of why this drug, as you say, is so intoxicating is that it's so tied up with these cultural values yes. that are all around us. That we, the, the role of the individual, the role of personal comfort or of personal success or right. these sort of things. And as you say, these, these concerns are so much on the heart of God right. for those on the margins, for, I mean, loving our neighbor in general is very other-centered, it's not exactly. self-centered, exactly. and uh, so we can become asleep to those, yeah, those concerns. Yeah. And, uh, I had this very interesting experience a, a couple of years ago. I was in a setting where I was a guest uh, pr speaker and preacher, um, and I was going to do this wedding on this same occasion, and I was at an event that therefore I was unknown to the people that were around, and I was just greeting people, talking to people at this event the day before the wedding was going to happen. And so this couple that I was talking to had presented themselves really as what I think I would have to describe as sort of the hot couple. That was their whole persona. It was what they candidly talked about. It was how they dressed. It was what absorbed their interests. It was how they talked about their uh, favorite substances to abuse. It's how they talked about many other things in their life. And I knew that eventually probably the conversation would turn toward, and, and what do you do? <laughs> so <laughs> eventually, yes, so right. eventually it came to, and what do you do? And I said, well, actually, I'm the pastor that's going to perform the wedding tomorrow. And on a dime, uh, as though they were conjuring this, they said, oh, you know what? We have Jesus too. Then being self-conscious about all that they had just said, about their own lives and about their uh, substance abuse and about many other things, they said, but you know, that's what really matters most, isn't it? Now, the interesting thing was that it felt like a holographic Jesus, right? A Jesus that they just kind of conjured and produced on command to also fill the Jesus slot of their life, but was completely disconnected from 
any kind of claims that it would have uh, a way of shaping their lives, their priorities, their values, their vision of the world. And it felt to me in a, in a tragic way, like there are lots of forms of Christian practice that I think land roughly in that terrain, where again, it felt very much like it had been a faith marginalized into the precincts of, I can have all of this and Jesus too. And that is a lot of the way that I think American Christianity in particular can frequently find itself stuck. And that is an enormous problem to a God who, who has a much larger vision of our life than that. You know, in the, in, in the book, you talk about these two inseparable loves that uh, trace the theme from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, you know, Jesus articulated these great commandments. You know, the first one is love God with your whole being. And the second one is like it, you know, love your neighbor. And, and, and it does seem that that at one level is so foundational and so basic. If there's anything we as a church ought to get right. is that those two belong right. together. Right. And it is so hard. Right. And I mean, I, I have to confess it's hard for me right. Right. so often because of, of concerns in my own life. And, and again, not bad things. Right. But, but it, it is our churches, and so, so often, I think the terminology asleep speaks powerfully to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I do think it captures it from my point of view. Um, and as I said in the book, uh, through one uh, reference, I talk about you can be asleep on your right side or on your left side, meaning whether you're on the right side of a political social agenda or on the left side of a political social agenda, either way, you can actually be asleep. And, and I don't think anybody, um, certainly not me, uh, can, stands in a place of, of, of holding the whole picture perfectly or, or fully. But at the same time, I think the thing that captures my imagination about this is that wakefulness is actually what we've been made for, and wakefulness is costly. So to actually be awake does complicate your life. It is actually easier to be asleep. I was recently in a setting where uh, I walked into a church that I had never visited before, and this rather enormous entryway that it had was filled with lazy boy chairs. And I thought, how amazing this is that you walk into the church and the first thing that you're offered physically is a lazy boy recliner. And there must have been 40 of them in this entryway. I was walking with an Eastern European friend who said at the end of this hallway that we passed through, he said, this must be a very wealthy church. I said, why, why do you say that exactly? He said. Well, clearly, uh, they're given to, to this, the, the sumptuousness of all these beautifully appointed, luxurious looking chairs. And I said, well, that's one way of understanding it. Maybe they are a wealthy church, but, but it feels to me like a church that almost by definition of that kind of, of decision has shown itself to be committed to sleep, right? To committed to relaxation, committed to comfort, committed to a, a vision that is about to me, what feels like disengagement rather than engagement. And it doesn't mean that we have to start wearing, um, you know, horsehair clothes and, uh, and um, you know, doing things that are purposely painful simply for their own, for their own ends. But I do think there's a strong sense that, that that image of a lazy boy chair is not so unlike um, an image that I think many people do get from the church. And, and the church, sadly, fits because it feels like we just want to make people feel comfortable. There's another side to this, though, I think, that, that I've also encountered. Because on the one hand, I, I mean, I'm in full agreement that church is asleep to things that really matter. But at other times, the church is so busy and so active. It feels like it's anything but asleep. There's no rest at the center of life. Now, tragically, oftentimes the things that we're so busy about are things that are far less important. Right. And so we haven't gotten the right agenda. But there is, there is this uh, side of American Christianity that's oftentimes very yeah. frenetic and, frenetic. And, and, and active. And um, I, I loved, one of the chapters that I loved in the book was uh, the one it's it's it was talking about uh, this connection of worship and justice it says doing justice begins with rest yes and the, the way that that uh, god himself after his creative activity he rests he's not he's not anxious he's not worried he's not frantic mm -hmm. he rests and it's out of that rest that he 
sustains the world and redeems the world. And talk, talk to me a little bit about that and that sort of balance. Because on the one hand, you don't want to be asleep, unconcerned. On the other hand, you don't want to be so active and distracted and stuff that also you can't focus on what's truly important. Right, right. And we can become easily overreaching. So uh, that chapter in the book uh, is a chapter that tries to say manic activism is not the call of, of, uh, of the Christian gospel. I don't think it is a suggestion that somehow the church is going to usher in the kingdom of God or usher in shalom or that social um, change is itself um, the, the end to which the church must be singularly wholly committed. But in the middle of all that, the, instead to understand that what we're doing as activists should be said in the context of a deep sense that God is the one who holds and makes shalom. We are the ones who are invited to participate in that, to enter into that and to live every day out of that sense of shalom. So I don't do it out of desperation. I don't do it with the franticness that suggests that if I don't make it happen, the world or the suffering is going to be perpetuated largely by my inability to be constantly and perpetually present responding to whatever crisis there may be. That would be a supreme form of, of self-idolatry that somehow could suggest that, that we are actually the ones who are going to be the solution to the world's problems. That just is a, is a distortion. But um, it's very different to then become an activist out of a deep sense of the reservoir of rest, shalom, Sabbath, that actually acknowledges that God is the, the one who actually holds these things and makes them happen. I mean, I, I've just so often been struck, as I know many have been over the years, of just reflecting on the significance of thinking that we should never be more than six days out from laying down all of the implements of our own productivity, our own sense of control, our own capacity to, to produce various things, and instead to just acknowledge that God who holds all things rests and calls us to genuinely practice Sabbath, a sense that we there is uh, an acknowledgement of our own finitude, of our limitations, of a dependency on God to be God, and for us to be reminded once again that we are clearly not. So even in the midst of what I hope is an activism that takes social needs seriously and seeking justice as a, as a high act of worship, that we would nevertheless acknowledge a God of worship that exceeds all of that activism and that really recontextualizes what it is that we're doing. It's not as though we're somehow doing it thinking that we are on the front edge uh, and the ones who are the bringers of it all. That's just not true. I find it so interesting that you, both the, the, the asleepness and the activism at times oftentimes flows out of the same root, which yes. is this very self-centered thing. Exactly right. I, I'm self-centered, so I'm unconcerned about anything outside of myself, or I'm self-centered in feeling like I have to be the one to do this. That's, that's exactly right. Yeah. I think that uh, in our context, as we're involved in ministry ourselves and training those for ministry, a lot of lot of people drawn to ministry are these activists. Right, right. And and workaholism mm -hmm. is is a huge issue. And of course, in ministry, it's easy to baptize that with I'm doing it for God. Yes, yes. You know, but but a lot of it flows out of this uh, either over assessment of yourself that I can actually mm -hmm. bring in the kingdom or this horrific fear that I'm going to prove to be inadequate if right. I don't work really yes, hard. But yes. it's all around self. And right. it's, it is that sense of being able to rest in God as God, in Christ as Savior and identity rooted in Him that then lets you relax enough to actually get out of yourself and be concerned about that neighbor. Right. That's right. Especially, as you say, the one that doesn't offer you a lot of social uh, reward right. in return. That's right. Well, I think this is one of the things that's captured so beautifully in Isaiah 58 when um, the prophet says that, that God looks upon our worship and realizes that it's really mostly about ourselves. And so much of our activism is really more about us, even when it's done in the name of God, than it is about God. And all kinds of Christian activity is really about satisfying often uh, some personal need or social need that really has little to do with God and has much more to do with our sensibility about how do we make, get our own needs met. And that's a very, that's a slippery slope that all of us share. And, and it's always there for us to slip on. And uh, everything that we're doing has, is susceptible to that possibility, which is why I think, again, some form of Sabbath keeping is really such an imp important way of tethering ourselves to a reminder that it's just really not about us. Now, ironically, we can take our Sabbath keeping practices, which 
are typically not observed at all, but if they are observed, might be thought of or associated with with weekly worship, for example, and then when that weekly worship really becomes mostly about the satisfaction of our own needs um, to produce if we're a pastor or to impress if we're a pastor or to be part of a social network of, of a highly active, creative, interesting church, let's say, that can be highly addictive in its own terms. And therefore, even the very moment that could actually rescue us from this distortion can actually also be a place where it's, we're entrapped in it yet again. That's the irony. That's part of the addictive quality of the drug that the church keeps feeding uh, to people. So when the church instigates the very thing that is centered on ourselves as opposed to calling us to a satisfaction that's deep enough to be ultimately freed, uh, at least in some significant measure, from ourselves, that's a, that's a painful irony. And, and it's in that place that I think often the church does really live. Let me uh, jump in here on the, on the issue of, of worship. Um, part of your argument, some people could be saying, oh, there are a lot of sleeping churches, but I am so involved, I'm so active in my church, I'm not that person who's asleep right now. Uh, so one of the par paradoxes, ironies of your argument that gets to the dangers, the false dangers of worship, is that, that, that um, let's call it religi religiosity, adjectival Christianity, is actually a product of this wakefulness that you're talking about, this, this depressant drug that allows us to live in the oblivion of our, our cultural assumptions. Right. So we'll talk about that, that false worship and the dangers of false worship that perpetuate this sleepiness. And on the other hand, let's just talk briefly about the true danger of worship and how that awakens us uh, mm -hmm. to life in God. Yeah. Well, when I think about the false dangers, they, I try to name some of them that have occurred to me in, in the book, but, um, but largely it's a sense that we get preoccupied by things that matter, but they matter disproportionately in the way that we practice them to what they really should actually matter. And so I talk about, for example, the danger of, of, um, of safety and comfort, which feels like it gets violated by uh, a certain vision of worship. So the anxiety that many pastors have is, I just need to be sure that this feels like it's like everybody's really comfortable, that we're having a really good time, that everybody really likes each other. It's a kind of con social control mechanism that's about keep the people happy, keep the customers coming back, keep the money flowing. All of that is part of the industry of church life, which you'd have to be self-deceived not to acknowledge is a factor of how s social arrangements actually exist and how the church often functions. So what might be done in God's name actually is really a, a done a, out of the convenience of perpetuating an institutional practice that needs people's presence or financial support or activism in order to perpetuate, but may have little to do with anything that's actually really a problem. So then it becomes, well, it's a really dangerous thing to, for example, introduce a new form of worship because you might unsettle people. So we're, we now think, oh, now it's really dangerous to do that because our people really might be upset. Uh, I have shared this um, example of a pastor friend of mine who, uh, in a very formal East Coast church, changed the dress that was required of the ushers. And it had been a church that was so formal that the ushers wore morning suits on Sunday mornings. And he simply said that they should wear dark suits. First of all, the assumption was that they were all men. The second was that they would wear morning suits and could, but in this case, they all would certainly have a dark suit. It seemed a modest change. Um, but there were people in the church that were up in arms over the thought that that this was happening and really called in question whether he should remain their pastor because of having made such a quote devastating move against the culture of the church. So he might think that therefore it was dangerous to say to people uh, we're no longer going to wear morning suits we're going to wear dark suits and suddenly we think that's the danger whereas the danger I would say is is not confronting the self-interested idolatry of tradition that in that sense defines culture in a way that is so um, particular to a certain subset and has almost nothing to do with the instincts of the kingdom of God that I think move in, in radically different and much more risk-taking ways than that. So then we think, well, if we've exhausted ourselves around morning suits versus dark suits, what energy is there going to be to call people to the much more dangerous act of truly worshiping a God who wants to actually re reform our life from the inside and call us to an entirely different set of social instincts? That's, that is dangerous. Yeah, and, and, and these false dangers, I mean, I read those, I could identify with all sure. of them. We've, yeah. we've all been there because, um, you know, we, we, we want worship to be 
to have a certain buzz about it, yes. to have a certain appeal to it, because people don't keep coming. And, you know, and when a pastor is kind of insecure, and we all are at some level, you know, that reflects on me, and this is my right. job, and this is my livelihood, right. and all that. Right. And so, you know, a lot of pastors feel caught in worship wars of one kind or another. Right. They, they feel tremendous tension, because on the one hand, if if this group is not happy that, that it's agitating for new and different kinds of worship, they're going to be dissatisfied. They might go to that other hot church down the street, but then the, the, maybe the more uh, traditional wing, if they're not happy, they're going to leave. And oftentimes they maybe have some uh, financial support that they could lend to us. And, and you've got to navigate this, and it's so right. hard. And, right. and the real issues... The real war over worship right. is whether we will come to share God's heart. Right. That worship is not only that hour or hour and a half of corporate gathering. It's also how we live all of our lives right. uh, to, to, in accordance with the values that, that the God we claim to worship has. And uh, so we have to learn how to weight our dangers. Right. And, and really be fearful of the most serious dangers right. and trust God enough to lay aside some of the lesser dangers, which are, right. don't, are not non-existent, right. but they're not, not as serious. Right. And yet that, that lower rank can be so controlling that we never actually get to the real dangers of what actually are, is meant to be the transformative power of the gospel that really calls us to this uh, completely new sociology that's part of the kingdom of God. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it is a... This is why I suppose I keep coming back to the image of, of sleep because it feels as though it's, it does contain to some degree that sense that we're just completely locked away. It's not as though we're not breathing. It's not as though we're, uh, we're completely non-functioning. But we are not present to the things that actually matter most to the heart of God. That's why the, the sleep image is at least one way of trying to capture some of that. I thought it was... Uh, uh, the the biblical image that you used was of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, yes. who in exile in Babylon were confronted with a demand to worship this idolatrous statue yes. or be thrown into this fiery furnace. Right. And the danger of the fiery furnace was real, but right. they understood that the danger of idolatry in the presence of the one holy God was far more dangerous. Right. They chose... Um, the lesser to face the lesser danger right. to avoid the greater danger right. and i thought that was a great way to conceptualize this hierarchy mm -hmm. of these sort of mm -hmm. dangers that that confronts us all yeah I, I do think that text puts its finger on this call to become discerning about which is really the greater danger and i think the fire in that case is so vivid it would be easily understood why a person would be controlled by that um and there's t plenty of times in my life when the fire has been de definitional to me. <laughs> I'm so aware of the fire that I, I will do anything to avoid the fire while surrendering sometimes to, therefore, to the, to the greater danger. The, the, the approval or the disapproval of those people right. is so immediate, yeah. so tangible. Yeah. I remember a time as pastor where I, in the span of one week, had two different elders come in and say to me, in essence, uh, I'm resigning from my position on the elder board. Our families are leaving the church and it's basically because I'm dissatisfied with you. Yes, yes. And that felt so immediate yes, and so absolutely. tangible to be able to say, well, the thing that matters most is that God is yes. pleased. Yes. <laughs> I really believe that, right. but, but it's, it's sometimes hard to hang on to that. Right. Well, and the question in a moment like that too is that in candor, you have to discern whether or not it's because you've really been faithful or whether you really haven't been faithful, whether you, there's something here for you to really learn and you've actually blown it and, and it's completely legitimate that people should have a response or whether it's actually they've gotten diverted into the wrong place it's or almost always some of yeah and it's all it is almost some, some of both and and it is a, a very tricky thing to be able to then figure out where the freedom of this is I mean I had a similar experience where uh, our session made a decision about something which was very controversial and there was a senior man in the church a very respected beloved man by me and by other people who came and invited me out to lunch I as I've said, I knew that it was not going to be a happy meal and that we were going to have an awkward uh, conversation and in a fairly elaborate way with fairly rich vocabulary of adjectives. He described just how lame I had been as a pastor and why 
this decision was just completely wrong. So we talked about it, um, and I could tell that this was going to be residual for him for some time, and I did a number of things to, to try to respond. It felt like it was one of those decisions that could have gone differently than it did, but it was a, it was a, it was a wise decision, I think, and, but not uncontested, so that was certainly true. So the next week in worship, uh, as I, every time I got up to lead, he would turn his whole body so that he was looking away from me. Now, at first I thought, Mark, calm down. I think you're just being paranoid. Uh, but then it became clear that this was not a function of my paranoia, and this was actually really happening. And, and it didn't go on just one Sunday. It went on the next Sunday and the next Sunday, and it eventually went on for seven years. So every time I was in front of the church, which as the senior pastor was fairly commonly uh, the case, he would turn his whole body to look in another direction in the sanctuary. We did all kinds of things um, to try to respond to that and made some modest headway. But the thing that was telling to me was that I had to decide in that case the greater and lesser danger. The greater danger of that to me was that I would actually surrender to his judgment and that my ability to actually be the pastor to proclaim the gospel in that setting would be, if, would be wrongly affected by what I knew was his judgment toward me and what I was doing. And the question was whether or not I could live in freedom in the very moment, every Sunday, as he sat in the very predictable seat where he sat, uh, assessing me and my leadership negatively, could I live in that context free without surrendering to the temptation to then make him the enemy, without making him the bad guy, without pretending that perhaps some other decision could have been made or that it could have been better handled, that there were things that perhaps could, get, uh, could be learned in, in the process. That vortex is where we all live in some way or another. And, and that became really, in a way, its own spiritual discipline for me. I need today to again be free in the presence of God, to be right or to be wrong. Um, I could be wrong and need freedom as much as to be right and be freedom and be in freedom in that context. And certainly I think we get bound into all kinds of places where we're trying to make it all fit and work and justify it on the grounds of our own desire and need for approval or whatever it may be. And that was certainly a potential trap for me. He was a highly respected, uh, revered person by me and by others, and his approval would matter to me. Was it going to be controlling? Well, that's a totally different question. And um, it was a very, very important season. So there's churches, pastors all over the country, all over the world, uh, who are right now embroiled in some difficult situation, a worship war, um, deep financial issues. Uh, you mentioned uh, yesterday the church uh, with the no longer able to make uh, earthquake codes and having to raise $2 million for a tower, all sorts of issues, and they're feeling completely overwhelmed by it right now. Both of you have been saying those are legitimate concerns and they require careful thought and pastoral sensibility. Um, so what you're asking, what you're what you're wanting to offer those pastors as encouragement is, is in a sense, a change of perspective. Um, what exactly, in light of the conversation we've been having right now, what would you say to those pastors, not to avoid the issues that they're facing, but to help them, help lift them out of it, give them a sense of encouragement and direction in ministry um, that, that gets purpose back to, the, to their, their pastoral calling, that allows them to have this true danger, sense of the danger of of worship and the, and the glory of worship mm -hmm. that can give, can give purpose and direction back to their ministry. And one of the things that I think uh, needs to happen with regard to the issue of worship, and uh, Mark, the book is helpful in this regard, but I think we need to be able to enlarge our understanding of worship. That worship, yes, does embrace this corporate experience of the, of the gathered church with all of its complexities and all of its wonderful patterns and familiarity and all of its newness and all of those issues connected with, but it's more than that. That, uh, you know, Paul says in Romans 12, 1, that we offer our bodies to God as living sacrifices and that's worship. That's true worship. So worship is larger than just what happens Sunday morning. It embraces all of life. and. The, the need is that we have congruence between what happens on Sunday and what happens Monday through Saturday. And if, if, if our vision of worship can um, grow, uh, there is a much richer and fuller and holistic sort of sense. If it doesn't, 
we can find ourselves under the same com condemnation that the prophets regularly uh, give, where, where through the prophets, God says, um, if the rest of your life doesn't match your worship, I hate your worship. And uh, so whether it's the positive vision of holism and freedom and comprehensiveness or uh, the, the sort of more negative picture of where that danger lies when there's this fragmentation and disconnect, we need that bigger picture of worship. It's a great transition to the second question, but let me just give you a quick uh, word well, of I, encouragement uh, for the pastor. Yeah, I, I think that um, often those crises of pastoral life make it seem that the world has shrunk to a very small space of that crisis that's defined by that cluster bomb of people, personalities, issues, debates, contention, whatever it may be. And I, I think one of the gifts of worship is that worship, faithful worship is, is a soul, mind, spirit enlarging experience. It's, it, it gives us space. It's what the, I think the psalmist means when he says in several places, the Lord has set us in a broad place. And I think in a time of crisis, one of the things that happens is that all of that shrinks. You then can feel like you're on the knife edge of something that if you get it wrong, if it can't be resolved, it's an on-off moment. You're going to uh, cut to something that's core and essential and potentially life or ministry threatening. And, and I think the gift of worship in a time like that can help to simply help remind us that really the reality that we're living is actually much bigger than it now feels and appears. And it's really shaped by this God who holds all things. And the picture of the large story of what God is doing is much, much greater than the, than the micro drama of what a particular moment of church life is really about. And, and I just find it um, very helpful to breathe deeply, to acknowledge a much deeper, broader grace, a picture of what God's doing in the world today or any given day that's much bigger than the particular myopic crisis that might be absorbing my spirit and mind today, but really I'm, I'm, I'm refreshed and reminded by the, the totality of what God is doing that's much more life-giving often than just being caught in a little cul-de-sac of church life, thinking somehow it, that everything matters in that little terrain and everything else doesn't matter. Instead, I need to flip it around and understand that there's a much bigger picture of what is vital and alive and assured and clear, even while it's also true that right now I'm living on a cul-de-sac with a lot of threatening or difficult or awkward times.